It's the Single African Market Program. Welcome. And this week, we're going to take you to the global stage. We'll take you to the continental stage. We will also bring you to the national stage here at the commercial capital of Africa, Accra, Ghana, because that's the International Chamber of Commerce uh, that's proudly associated with this program. And they are the world's largest association of businesses with about 45 million businesses in about 130 countries uh, so far, representing businesses at the United Nations and almost everywhere. They have trained lawyers in Ghana in the area of arbitration as well as dispute resolution. I will tell you a lot more about it because the dispute resolution mechanism of the EFCFTA is operational and uh, that's one area that the AFCFTA Secretariat has touted as one of the successes of the Secretariat. So we'll tell you about what the ICC is doing, how it connects with the AFCFTA, and who are the beneficiaries, and what are their impact. We'll tell you a lot more about that. We're also going to take you all the way to uh, Brussels in Belgium, where the African Union as well as the European Union Summit took place. But for now, Let's hit Addis Ababa, Ethiopia, where the uh, African Union Commission headquarters is located because the AU summit took place over there. The issue of the continental free trade area took center stage. In particular, the Prime Minister of Ethiopia highlighted that area. Let's take a listen and we will be back. The Assembly of African Union Heads of State and Government held its 35th ordinary session and the first to be held in person since the COVID-19 pandemic at the AU headquarters in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. The opening session was marked with calls for continued African solidarity in addressing the impact of COVID-19 on the continent and the urgent need to address the emergent scourge of coup d'etats and the threats of terrorism. The Ethiopian Prime Minister, Dr. Abiy Ahmed, whose country hosts the AU headquarters, called on the leaders to collectively make the effort to boost intra-Africa trade on the continent. Our continental free trade agreement holds the greatest promise of effectively realizing continental integration and development. The potential for increased intra-Africa trade, free movement of people, and investment and self-reliance is a beacon for Africa's renaissance. And instead of depending solely on trade out of Africa, our collective effort to boost intra-Africa trade will protect us from the fluctuation of global economy, economic and political change. He highlighted the potential of the tourism sector on the continent. Similarly, the potential for continent-wide tourism remains untapped. It is part of aspiration of five of Agenda 2063, which seeks to create an Africa with a strong cultural identity, common heritage, values, and ethics. Dr. Ahmed advocated that the more Africans know each other as a continent, the more they will be able to resist forces that divide and undermine them. The greatest lesson that Ethiopia has learned over the past year is that without the solidarity of our African brothers and sisters, our existence as a nation would have been at great risk. This affirms the wisdom of our forefathers and foremothers in their dream of Pan-Africanism. The old saying is true, united we stand, divided we fall. He expressed hope in the future of young people on the continent. A continent of 1.3 billion people, a substantial percentage of them young and dynamic, will drive Africa's prosperity and pull it out of poverty as we set forth in our agenda 2063. The Prime Minister of Ethiopia, however, took exception to the fact that seven decades after the formation of the United Nations, Africa remained a junior partner without meaningful input or role in the system of international governance and call for reform of the United Nations to reflect current global realities with equitable representation. This is particularly true of the United Nations, where Africa lacks representation on the Security Council and is underrepresented in a variety of ways. It is the right time to reform and revitalize the United Nations system 
to reflect current global realities and ensure that it is a more representative and equitable body. So that was some of the highlights of the uh, 35th session of the African Union Summit that took place uh, earlier this month. And we chose to dwell on the speech of the Ethiopian Prime Minister uh, because he captured most of the things and highlighted most of the things and the concerns uh, that were raised uh, at the AU Summit. They're talking about the United Front of Africans, also talking about the EFCFTA, which is key to all of us, and talking about Africa's representation at the global governance level particularly at the United Nations uh, there. But right after the AU summit, His Excellency, the Secretary General of the EFCFT Secretariat, His Excellency Wam Kilimene headed to the Arab Republic of Egypt, uh, Cairo to be specific, where he met with the Trade and Industry Minister of the Arab Republic of Egypt. He revealed some important outcome as far as the AFCFT is concerned. Listen. Uh, the Secretary General of the EFCFT Secretariat has met with the Egyptian Minister of Trade and Industries to reveal that African heads of states have agreed at the 35th session of the AU summit that the continent commences trading at the existing rules of origin negotiated so far by the Council of Trade Ministers of Africa. He said the heads of states express excitement about the level of work done by the Council of Trade Ministers so far. Let me start, uh, Honorable Minister, with the rules of origin. We are now at 87.7% uh, on uh, rules of origin, convergence, uh, which is uh, uh, very, very good. It's a very good start. Uh, and this was reported to the heads of states, and so they congratulated the ministers for that. They also said that we must now start trading, uh, that we have no, you know, we can't keep delaying and going back to them. Uh, so there is much as they recognize that we made very, very good progress on rules of origin. But uh, they said, uh, please don't keep coming back to us for more, for more time. Um, however, uh, they did agree for a, um, an extension of uh, six months on, uh, to conclude the remaining areas of rules of origin, that is textiles and clothing. Um, automobile, automobiles, as well as um, some tariff lines, sugar, edible oils, and so on. And so we have now a new mandate to conclude by June, before the media coordination summit in July. So that means we have a very tight uh, uh, deadline uh, to finish uh, rules of origin. But we've made very good progress, and I said this to both the Executive Council um, and the heads of states that even though we have not uh, gotten to the 90%, but we have a very, very strong uh, basis uh, for the start of trading. So exciting revelation coming from the Secretary General of the EFCFTA Secretariat that the heads of states of African states are excited about the 87.7% percent approximately 88 percent negotiated rules of origin and that the continent is ready to trade they say uh, you know don't even keep coming back to the heads of state you can go ahead and start trading talking to the secretary general as well as the council of trade uh, ministers of the continent of africa good news we'll keep an eye on this particular development and tell you how things are going to go because there are a few things that definitely needs to be ironed out it's not as if as soon as they say go trade then you just go and trade and you get to know more uh, when the secretary general also visited the world customs organization some revelations came out of that but before then the african union as well as the european union uh, has held its sixth uh, summit in Brussels, Belgium. Again, the AFCFTA was highlighted and took center stage in their discourse. Listen. The Sixth African Union, European Union Summit has been held in Brussels with a vision to consolidate a renewed partnership for solidarity, security, peace and sustainable economic development and prosperity for citizens and for future generations of both AU and EU member states. The two continental bodies agreed on enhanced access to the digital 
and data economy while boosting digital entrepreneurship and skills, sustainable growth and decent job creation by investing in the establishment of youth-owned businesses in Africa, transport facilitation and efficiency of connected transport networks, as well as human development, notably through scaling up mobility and employability of students, young graduates and skilled workers. Both the AU and the EU agree to boost regional and continental economic integration, particularly through the African continental free trade area, while acknowledging that existing trade agreements between the EU and some African countries have contributed to the strengthening and deepening of trade and economic development between the two continents. The two bodies agree to work gradually towards a progressive and mutually beneficial integration of the respective continental markets. So all is working towards this integration agenda for the continent of Africa. And it's not as if once Africa is doing it, it's doing it entirely all alone. So others began it. The European Union began it way before Africa began it. So it shouldn't be surprising that you see the collaboration and the sharing of ideas and uh, comparing of notes here and there. And the fact that the two continents are agreeing on that tangent that it is important that they look at integration as an agenda for both continents, the better it is for all of us. But His Excellency Wam Kilimene, the Secretary General of the EFCFT Secretariat, did not just leave it there at the summit. He headed towards the World Customs Organization to engage them, also got an agreement together to be able to work hand in hand, allow a lot of trade facilitation activities go on, because customs is key as far as this whole AFCFT agenda. Back here in Ghana uh, and in Accra, the commercial capital of Africa in particular, customs is the competent authority of the AFCFT in Ghana. That is why it was important that the Secretary General of the AFCFT paid a visit to the Secretary General of the World Customs Organization. And while in Brussels, a memorandum of understanding was signed between the African Continental Free Trade Area Secretariat and the World Customs Organization, aimed at operationalizing the tariff schedules and ensuring additional free and efficient movement of goods in Africa. The MOU was signed in Brussels, Belgium, by His Excellency Wam Mene, Secretary General of the EFCFT Secretariat, and the Secretary General of the WCO, His Excellency Kunio Mikuria. The EFCFT Secretariat and the WCO are united in their shared goal of increasing prosperity in Africa through the liberalization of trade on the continent. According to the EFCFTA Secretariat, the MOU represents the next logical step for the two organizations as they work to reduce barriers to trade across Africa by connecting custom systems, populating the EFCFTA tariff book, and providing capacity building for customs officials and administration. The EFCFTA Secretariat says, the collaboration is set to capacitate the AFCFTA with one, technological systems that would allow standardization of data and connectivity of custom systems. Two, a developed AFCFTA e-tariff book. Three, enhanced skills and expertise of customs officials in operationalizing the AFCFTA. Four, migration of all AFCFTA member states to HS 2022. And five, Effective start of trading using the EFCFTA tariff book. The EFCFTA Secretariat says the agreement will allow the two organizations to work together and support each other as they address logistical challenges while seeking to implement programs and develop trade across Africa. Mr. Wam Kelemene, Secretary General of the EFCFTA Secretariat, said, quote, the MOU would enable the WCO to partner with the EFCFTA in ensuring that customs administrations are fully equipped to implement the EFCFT agreement. So we've got a lot going on at the global stage. We've got a lot happening also at the continental uh, stage. And back here in Ghana, the commercial capital of Africa, a lot also going on here uh, because the International Chamber of Commerce, the world's largest association of businesses uh, with about 45 million businesses across the entire world in about 130 countries uh, representing businesses at even the United Nations and all of that, they have begun training 
lawyers in the area of arbitration and dispute resolution here in Ghana. They believe that this is the direction to go. Now, dispute resolution mechanism is a protocol of the AFCFT, a very important protocol. As a matter of fact, the Secretary General has mentioned it quite often that it is one of the success stories of the Secretariat for bringing that into operationalization. So the ICC believes that this is a time that lawyers, uh, particularly within Africa and also in Ghana, need to be trained in this direction so that they can understand arbitration deeper, they can take on dispute resolutions, particularly when the continent is heading towards massive trading. As Africa prepares to commence trading under the Continental Free Trade Agreement, it will inevitably give rise to potential disputes concerning the rights and obligations under the EFCFT Agreement. The EFCFT Protocol and Dispute Settlement establishes a mechanism for the amicable resolution of such disputes. In accordance with that protocol, aggrieved state parties can request that a dispute be resolved by a panel. Currently, though, only state parties can request such dispute resolution. Private parties from state parties can petition the appropriate institutions in their governments to launch an action if they consider their rights have been affected. Third parties can, if the disputing parties agree, also be heard and make written submissions during the adjudication process. Before a matter can be heard by a panel, state parties are obliged to first hold confidential consultations to find an amicable solution. If an amicable solution is not achieved, the dispute settlement body will establish a formal panel composed of three to five persons selected from an indicative roster of panelists to adjudicate the dispute. Parties to the dispute may appeal a panel report to the appellate body, that is the AFCFTA Tribunal of Final Instance. The Secretary General of the AFCFTA says, the continent has succeeded in operationalizing its dispute settlement mechanism. Dispute settlement uh, mechanism and operationalizing it is very important. We want to express a commitment to, to Africans, to African business people, that um, we are committed to the rule of trade law. Where a dispute arises uh, in the context of trade, cross-border trade, the AFCFTA rules will be applied and the dispute settlement mechanism and its operationalization is specifically for that purpose so it's a it's a it's a tremendous success on the back of these developments among others the international chamber of commerce icc the world's largest and most representative business organization with over 45 million members in about 130 countries has embarked on training for lawyers in the government sector including legal advisors and state-owned enterprises on arbitration and dispute settlements. Approximately 20% of international disputes uh, resolved under ICC rules are disputes with states or state control entities. When it comes to Africa, the percentage is even higher. Why so? Because the states and state agencies are involved in international trade and they are involved in international projects and because of that inevitably disputes arise. Uh, but the problem is that sometimes, unfortunately, governments and government agencies, they are not familiar with procedure of resolving disputes of, by international arbitration. And this is why they are not properly represented, they do not, they do not react in time to various inquiries coming from the court or from arbitrators. This is why it's extremely important to have this training for uh, officials from Ghana government for state companies because they will get training how to represent their interests in case of disputes. Uh, what Ghana can learn from, from others is, is basically uh, that the process, they should always be involved in the process, hire good counsel, ensure that the, the counsel, the state uh, counsel are properly prepared to, to manage the proceedings. Uh, and, and basically to understand from the beginning that the, the process being involved is very critical. The International Chamber of Commerce International Court of Arbitration is a leading dispute resolution court in the world, hence its interest in building the capacity of government in that area. In terms of dispute resolution, apart from this program, and this program is unique because this program was developed specifically for Ghana, 
and it's tested here first time and it runs pretty successfully. Apart from that, there are programs for training of arbitrators, the training for counsel. Uh, there's ICC training on the beginning, uh, before you get to a dispute, so contracting, learning about international contracts. The ICC Institute itself, for which I, I'm a vice chair of, uh, is, is charged with developing programs not only on arbitration but also on international contracting and compliance. But the ICC International Court of Arbitration is the leading dispute resolution uh, institution globally. And uh, we want to encourage the use of ICC rules uh, in, in drafting of our contract and also the use of our court. The ICC believes that training lawyers of governments and SOUs of Ghana adequately positions the state to secure a robust and resilient economy in the wake of the AFCFTA. The AFCFTA protocol on arbitration is between uh, state parties. So uh, the private sector doesn't come in quite clearly. So the right uh, uh, personnel that needs to be trained on that as those that we've assembled today. Arbitration and generally having practitioners and particularly where the state uh, and state-owned entities are so involved in the economic sectors, having those lawyers prepared, being able to understand the process, being able to take advantage of the procedural steps that are available, that kind of training I think is critical to ensuring that uh, the great uh, investment that's being made in these sectors is realized. So the ICC says a lot is motivating them to begin to do this and this is not the only training that they're going to engage in. Uh, quite a number of activities towards arbitration and dispute resolution are on their way. With respect to arbitration or dispute resolution, let's say more generally, it is expected to be the normal way of resolving commercial disputes. That's already true in so many regions of the world. If you go to Europe, that is the normal way of resolving disputes. If you go to North America, even to some extent in Latin America or in Asia. In Africa, with the entry into force of the AFCFTA, transactions will grow. We all know that that is expected. Now, with these transactions, disputes will happen as well. And those disputes, even if we're talking about Africa as a whole, the mistake is that Africa is, very, is multiple, it's very different. And so... It's diverse. It's diverse, exactly. Thank you. And so a dispute happening between a Ghanaian party and one in Mali, that dispute, you already have a language barrier. Then you have a legal system barrier between common law and civil law. And then you add to that the organization of the legal system uh, as a barrier. With arbitration, you're talking about each of those parties being able to, uh, to play their part in the parameters of how their dispute is going to be resolved. And with arbitration, you're giving them a forum where they feel comfortable it's neutral. I'm not in front of the, I'm the Ghanaian, I don't want to go in front of the Malian court. And I am the Malian, I don't want to go in front of the Ghanaian court because I would not feel there's some, some degree of maybe of, of you know. Insecurity, maybe, yeah, Exactly, maybe not distrust, but insecurity. With arbitration, it's a neutral forum. We both participate to the building of the arbitral tribunal. We both um, make this panel that will ultimately adjudicate our dispute. So um, within the context of AFCFTA and all of these uh, transactions, the growth in the transactions and the growth in the dispute, arbitration is a necessary tool for Africa and in, in particular for African trading in the context of AFCFTA to make sure that they do have this neutral forum for the resolution of the disputes that will arise. Now that we have the dispute resolution mechanism, what would you encourage African lawyers, and particularly Ghanaian lawyers, to begin to look at? What are the opportunities out there, for instance, with ICC, beyond having this training right here? What are the opportunities out there that lawyers in Ghana, lawyers in Africa, can begin to take advantage of? The, the opportunities are multiple. You see, the reality today is that there is a, a, a clear underrepresentation of African legal practitioners in the area of arbitration. That is just a natural result of the fact that arbitration first developed uh, quite widely in the Western world. And we've seen over time some regions like Latin America, where initially there were very few practitioners doing arbitration, and now a bigger share of, uh, and a much bigger, I should say, share of uh, Latin American practitioners are present, and they even 
uh, uh, they even adjudicate disputes that uh, that touch on 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 projects that are not necessarily located in their own continent. The same way, that's the vision we have for the IC, for Africa at the ICC. It's that to train the African uh, legal practitioners at large in order to give them the opportunity to become those that will make the decisions for the cases arising from ICC, uh, from African trade and African cross-border uh, uh, trading. The idea is to equip all our younger lawyers as well as those more senior, to equip those who are you know, retired judges, uh, those who are potentially going to be counsel or expert with a very good understanding of the international arbitration procedure for them to then be able to combine their knowledge of African laws and African legal systems and bring them into the resolution of those disputes and become the real operators of the resolution of those disputes. So in short, the opportunities are multiple and huge and the ICC not only offers this kind of you know, training programs for government, we do it for lawyers, we do it also for uh, younger people as uh, potentially tribunal secretary, and we also now have mentorship. What about the program. private sector? We same. We meet one on one with in-house lawyers in companies to uh, make them to raise awareness about international arbitration, about the interest of having those arbitration clauses in their contract, and ultimately, um, then for them to be in a position to. When they, they, when they decide to introduce an arbitration clause in their contract, to also understand how the resolution will be and turn to an African lawyer to assist them in the resolution of that dispute. So as I was saying, the, the, the opportunities are really multiple. And one program that we are having uh, that uh, is very interesting, and I hope to see uh, some Ghanaian lawyers uh, join that, is a mentorship program by which ICC will allow uh, young African practitioners to come in and observe uh, arbitral tribunal rendering uh, decisions, adjudicating disputes in the context of a hearing, um, and learn by way of observation. So that's uh, something that we're really proud about. That's a program that we hope will really boost uh, uh, arbitration in Africa and, and sort of shape the future leaders of uh, arbitration in Africa. Yeah, the continental level, what would you expect come out from the AFCFTA. Are you seeing enough that the arbitration and dispute resolution is taken center stage in all the conversation we're having when it comes to the AFCFTA? Look, the dispute resolution uh, uh, debates or discussions that are happening with the AFCFTA are focusing on state-to-state -state dispute resolution, and that's absolutely normal given the... the, the, the exactly, the exactly. Um, the, the, what the ICC does is does not intervene at that level, right? However, it is extremely important for AFCFTA and a, an organization like ICC to be able to work together because ultimately AFCFTA is providing the legal framework and the legal context for those transactions that will ultimately give rise to disputes to happen. So because of that, AFCFTA is, the, is very well positioned uh, to uh, provide or to help the users of this you know, trade area or this trade agreement uh, in uh, having fora, different fora for the resolution of the dispute. That can be ICC arbitration, but also we know there are uh, very good centers on the continent doing arbitration that are very viable options for uh, the resolution of commercial disputes. So basically, my vision is that AFCFTA uh, really, the, the hope is that AFCA, AFCFTA sorry, will work in partnership with organizations such as the ICC in order to provide a, 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 a solid legal infrastructure to the uh, individual private sector and governmental agents that are involved in those transactions. <laughs> So the International Chamber of Commerce believes that it is the best time to engage the continent's lawyers and even the best time to partner maybe with the AFCFTA uh, to be able to uh, train a lot more lawyers in the area of arbitration and dispute uh, resolution. Now, a former Attorney General of Ghana who incidentally is Ghana's representative at the International Chamber of Commerce uh, International Court of Arbitration is also throwing a lot more light on the significance of arbitration and dispute resolution, particularly for lawyers in government as well as state-owned enterprises. We've observed 
quite a number of arbitration cases that you have followed, including the maritime arbitration between Ghana and La Côte d'Ivoire and all of that. To what extent do you think that it's important for government agencies and governments of Ghana and Africa in general to understand arbitration? For state agencies and for ministries, departments, companies wholly owned by government or partially owned by government, all your lawyers must be trained in international arbitration. The fact of the matter is that a lot of the agreements we execute have arbitration as a method of resolving the dispute. That's the international agreements we sign. That's because if you are entering into an agreement with a foreign company, of course they would want a neutral arbiter to decide any dispute that arises between them and Ghana. So of course they'll ask for international arbitration which is removed from the jurisdiction of, of, of Ghana as the method for resolving any dispute that arises between that foreign company and Ghana. So you find in many of the agreements signed by government and signed by our statutory bodies with foreign companies, you have international arbitration as the method of resolving the dispute. Now, if we have these clauses in the agreements, our lawyers must know what it's all about. And so we must receive training consistently. First of all, even how do you draft an arbitration agreement? How do you select an arbitrator? What should be contained in terms of reference? What is a procedural order? You need to know all those things, which form part of the arbitral process. If the lawyers of the, of the state agencies and lawyers of government do not know what these things are, how do they advise their, their, their and institutions, people, various institutions, institutions and, and the government in general? And the government in general. And, and you pay, pay your experience and your observation within the Ghanaian environment, to what extent do we take arbitration seriously, particularly in our government sectors, in our government agencies? Um, if you compare that with, and you, you, have, you sit on the arbitration court of the ICC as well, so if you compare that with what we have elsewhere overseas, how seriously are we taking arbitration? Well, for once, you know, for, I've seen so many lawyers here, and for me, it's a starting point that the lawyers who work for state agencies are taking it serious. Because it's very serious business over there. How do you even formulate your claim if you have to go for international arbitration? How do you formulate your answer? It is not the same as we have it in our courts, which we are used to all the time. And so you need to take it seriously because when an award is given against the state, it's very difficult to set it aside. Once our dispute resolution center is set up, we must settle our disputes within Africa. If we have such and we begin to settle our disputes within, what level of capacity do we require from our own lawyers to be able to meet their standards? How do we amass the wealth of the resources that we have among our lawyers to be able to deal with our disputes down here? Training, training, training. We need to, I mean, improve ourselves. You know, some of the lawyers have been having a conversation with me that, I mean, how do they get involved? Do they get involved in alternative dispute resolution? It's just about investing <laughs> in yourself. You have to pay to get trained. And then one of the things that we need to do is to make sure that our lawyers are very involved in the disputes that arise within, that are submitted to arbitration. So, yes, we employ foreign counsel. I mean, that has been the practice of the state, to employ foreign counsel and then, and then Ghanaian counsel. They must work together. Once you work together, you acquire some knowledge or the other, but we have the expertise here. So across all sectors, across all areas, people are preparing, people are getting ready. You saw the lawyers there uh, preparing themselves in the area of 
uh, dispute resolutions, arbitration here and there. Doctors ought to be preparing. Journalists ought to be preparing to embrace uh, this new wave of continental integration because whether you like it or not, that's the direction that the continent is heading towards and you don't want to be left behind there. You need to be impacted by it positively. So you need to also prepare yourself, also train yourself in the areas that you definitely need as an individual or even as an entity. Now, if you listen to the speeches that have been made, particularly that uh, the speech that was made at the AU summit, the speech that was made at the AU-EU summit, all of them dwelt and focused significantly on the future of African youth and the future of young people in business. And now those of us on the single African market, we've made it a point to be uh, profiling and highlighting the works of some young people particularly who are innovating, those who are involved in entrepreneurship, because we believe that's the direction and the future of the continent. One area that was mentioned at the AUEU summit is digital economy, how we can take advantage of the digital space to survive, trade and survive. And there's a young man here in Ghana who is doing remarkably well. He's drawing and he has a solid artwork and he's trading his artwork digitally. So he designs digitally, he draws uh, his artwork digitally, and he markets them digitally. And he's living on this big time. You need to meet him. He's our entrepreneur for this week. actually do um, traditional arts and I do um, digital arts as well. Whilst in Accra Academy, I was introduced to um, African math and sculpture pieces. Back in 2010, I was experimenting with coral draw and Photoshop and all that. In 2017, I started doing traditional arts. So as time went on, I developed my artistic skill and kind of focused more on um, the African math influence. So that became like a my stylistic representation. I actually got an email from one of these um, NFT marketplaces and, and they were interested in uh, me putting up my digital artwork on their platform to sell. So that's when I started selling my digital artwork as NFTs. But um, way before then I was doing digital art. It's just something that I love to do and I've always been doing it. So the NFTs just served as an avenue to sell my digital art. From selling my, my um, digital artists with NFTs. I've been able to live off that. So now I, I, I'm a full-time artist. I do digital arts as full-time. I live off that. I've done exhibitions with um, other international artists online and digitally. And I've, I've worked on um, some projects with some artists. For instance, um, I was on Cyberbat, which is, uh, was an, a digital art exhibition with other African artists. And there was this um, NFT international project where I worked on and it was made up of artists all over the world and we created pieces that we sold as NFTs and I've had my artworks exhibited at um, NFT NYC which was like the first um, digital art exhibition in New York. I've been on other um, digital um, exhibitions such as um, some in um, Paris. I've sold a couple of my traditional pieces and I have some of my traditional pieces at um, the Bouquet Foundation as well. So I noticed that a lot of people had no idea what NFTs were. So it was so hard for people to grasp the concept. I actually educated a lot of a lot of Ghanaian artists, a lot of African artists on NFTs, but some of them were still finding it hard to understand the concept. However, a few of them were able to jump onto NFTs. There was this one Ghanaian artist who was actually she was living in Switzerland. She's a Ghanaian, but she was born and raised in Switzerland. And she took advantage of uh, my class and then she learned a few things and then she's also an NFT artist now and she's selling her work. And there are other um, Ghanaian artists, there are other Nigerian artists that approach me. Sometimes they get in contact via Instagram or, uh, or Twitter, they ask me for advice, they want to know more about NFTs and I always make sure I have time, I, give, I make time for them, I just get on a Zoom call and then I teach them for free. Because I think that the NFT is a big thing and it's very important for Ghanaian and African artists, you know, to make some money off it. So I always 
don't you know ignore when I have the chance to educate people or teach people about NFTs. So far as NFTs are concerned, you would have to understand the concept of cryptocurrencies and then you get to understand the concept of NFTs and how they work. The main blockchain, blockchain is like basically the type of technology so far as cryptocurrencies is concerned. There is Bitcoin, which is the most valuable cryptocurrency now. The second most valuable is Ethereum and Ethereum is the biggest blockchain so far as NFTs are concerned. The other blockchain of blockchains as well. So for Ethereum, what you would have to do is that you just need to have a digital wallet and this digital wallet would have to be connected to your marketplace. So there's a, a digital wallet known as MetaMask. The other digital wallets, but the most the common one is MetaMask. And when you have MetaMask digital wallet, what happens is that it helps you connect to the marketplaces. And when you connect to the marketplaces, that is the wallet that helps you put your digital artwork on these marketplaces or on the blockchain, the Ethereum blockchain. And when anybody purchases your work, the Ethereum goes into your wallet. So when it gets into your wallet, you can decide to withdraw or transfer it to another um, crypto um, 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 marketplace or you can decide to transfer it to another crypto wallet, however you want it. And if you want to um, convert it to currency, you want to convert it to CDs or USD, you just need to find another crypto wallet that helps you convert your Ethereum to Dallas or crypto or CDs and then you, you get your money. As, a, as an artist, it's already hard. You sell your works, you're probably you might not be able to sell and all that. But NFT change the dynamic because me personally, NFT change the whole dynamic. I can live off um, selling my digital artworks. I don't do any other work. I focus on digital art and I am um, financially comfortable now I, as I would want to put it. So for other artists, it's been really great. There are other artists like um, a Nigerian artist known as um, Osinachi, who was, who was actually the first African NFT artist. And he has sold his works for over $100,000 in a bird. And he, he is making ridiculous waves in the NFT marketplaces. There are other artists too who are thriving so far as Africa is concerned. And they are all making um, waves and they are benefiting greatly. I'm also benefiting greatly, just that sometimes I don't want to discuss my, you know, financial details, but yes. I am someone who have done it for like about two years and I've had a lot of experience and I know that this is something that a lot of Ghanaian artists can actually jump on. I have plans to do a lot of collaboration with other um, digital NFT artists as well. With Aftab, it would make certain things easy, like for instance, the, when we, we held the cyber bath, a part of it was held, held as a, a physical exhibition in Senegal, so it would be very easy to move, travel to Senegal with some of my physical pieces, and it would be easy to interact with Senegal, easy, easy to move in and out, and it would be easy to um, do other physical exhibitions in other parts of Africa as well, which would probably be harder if not for um, our first initiative. So this after initiative embodies me to definitely try to um, jump onto other African markets and then educate or help educate the other artists in this, for instance, in countries like Liberia and then Sierra Leone in Gabon. Um, mostly West African countries. I have the um, goal of taking that knowledge of NFTs and education of NFTs to them. So I think that um, with our access initiatives, it's going to help me easily access these people from these African and um, West African countries. And that's what, like one of the biggest things, because if it's not easy to get access to them, then it will be hard to share this knowledge that I have with them. That's a very solid uh, visual artist, a young man there who's making it uh, big time, surviving on his visual arts, uh, which he designs digitally. And he treats them digitally. Uh, he's the first uh, NFT artist in, here in Ghana. And then uh, he's been living on this big time. Now, the reason why the story of Pate interests me a lot, because he captures one area of the EFCFTA that is under discussion, and that is e-commerce. He's already begun that area, uh, digital trading going on there. It's an area that the EFCFTA is discussing uh, cryptocurrency and all of that. Pate has taken the lead over there, uh, and he's surviving on this. Now, you can imagine that if he found himself uh, within the COVID 
era where he can't go out to exhibit his uh, visual arts. Uh, how could he have survived if he didn't know about this digital trading that he has already begun? I'm sure that he will prick the conscience of the authorities within the AFCFT implementation uh, to be able to speed up the discussions on e-commerce here and there because it was already discussed at the AUEU summit over there. <laughs> So the weather report for all African cities coming up next on your screens as well as the flight schedules leaving the commercial capital uh, of Africa to the rest of the cities on the continent of Africa as well as the forest rate for the African market and the AFCFTA party status. Now let me remind you once again that Cabo Verde is the 41st country to deposit its instruments of ratification. from the Secretary General of the Secretariat of the EFCFTA that the heads of states of the continent are excited about the 87.7, approximately 88% of rules of origin negotiated and that the continent should begin trading. We are ready to trade. Whatever it takes for you to understand all the nitty gritties to be able to take advantage of the AFCFTA and the continent's agenda to create one market, please do. And you will thank all of us later. Thank you for watching the program. I uh, will see you same time next week.